celebration begin. Almost one million citizens of other countries became American citizens. One million. This brings the total amount of naturalized American citizens to almost 50 million. Comparing the latest figures of immigrants in different countries to the USA, the second country receiving the most immigrants that became naturalized citizens is less than 20% the amount that we have in America. Five times more than any other country. We are constantly made aware of the tremendous challenges this nation even now is facing on our southern border as each year, tens of thousands of unaccompanied children precariously cross into the land of opportunity and freedom. The USA was formed by immigrants. It's part of our fiber. That is the message that is broadcast 24-7, 365 by our national icon of freedom that sits in New York Harbor. In 1966, after spending five years in Brazil, mom, dad, and myself boarded a passenger ship in the southern port of Santos, Brazil. Destination, New York. Duration, two weeks to get there. I remember as if it were yesterday. I was 16 years old. So you don't... Um, Get hung up on that. I'm 61. No, I'm just kidding. You. Okay. 16 years old. I remember it so clearly pulling in the ship, pulling into New York Harbor. First time I'd ever been to New York. I was so excited to see the Statue of Liberty. I thought, this is just like 
immigrants from so many that have come into New York Harbor. There stands a lady. And I had the hardest time finding her. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I expected it just to be bigger than life as you, you know, just like that movie there, you know, you just sort of see it right there. I look for it. You know, there's all this clutter of port activity and everything, and I was looking around, and, and of course some others were helping me out, say, right over there, right over there, where? Right, right, oh, there it is! You know, when you see even something big, when it's surrounded by clutter, this week I was in the office early morning for our prayer time, and um, I was just meditating, and all of a sudden, kaboom! What is that? I looked out. There were only about three cars in the parking lot. And I thought, wow. What's that? There's one over there sort of facing funny. That lady had pulled in here and ran right into one of those posts there. And it was a brand new car. And she was sort of, she didn't see it. Why? All the background clutter. That's why I usually paint them yellow. Those, be careful, guys. It's painted gray. <laughs> but she was looking around, seeing where she was going. Right into the post. I mean, wow. Miss it. I almost missed the Statue of Liberty because of the clutter. It's not that big. Oh, but it's larger than life with what it represents. Even non-Americans can't watch that video clip without getting a little tingly. Because it's just phenomenal. It's a country that is just phenomenal. That's written on the base of that statue. It's part of this poem. I'm going to read the poem in its entirety. Written on the base is the last part. And I'll tell you when we get there. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, you ancient lands, keep your storied pomp, cries she with silent lives, uh, lips. Now, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That's what inspired our songwriter to write these words. And as we end the service this morning, we'll be listening to this song. But it goes like this. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky. And all who see her know she stands for her. Liberty for you and I. I'm so proud to be called an American, to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the Statue of Liberty. If you're like me, then you love America. For most who have lived for any period of time in another area of the world, as we've already spoken of, we who have lived in other areas of the parts of the world appreciate it so much. You know how very special and unique America is. Now, you may love America. You may hate America. And we're glad you're here this morning, either way. <laughs> However, one thing is non-negotiable based on the 238-year history of this great nation. No other country in the world comes even into the ballpark of having offered more freedom and opportunities 
to the less fortunate than the good old USA. No other country in the world has even come close to the religious freedom guaranteed by our Constitution. No other. That's why I say, God bless America. Let's say it together. God bless America. The yearning for freedom is what brought tens of millions to this nation over the 238 history, year history. It wasn't by chance that America has been the beacon of civil freedom for over 200 years. It was by design. See, the framers of this nation purposely wrote the founding documents in a way that they would reflect Judeo-Christian core values. Did you catch that? I don't care how many times they try to rewrite it, that's what happened. God has blessed America because America chose God, and don't forget it. That's so important. Because down the road, we'll probably receive the fruit of decisions we have made as a nation. Right now, we're receiving the fruit of decisions made according to Bible principle. Biblical principles. America is a beacon of freedom, but as always is the case, that freedom came at a tremendous cost. We honor the memory of so many who paid the ultimate price to guarantee our freedom. You see, freedom is never free. Freedom is never free. Someone always has to pay a price for freedom. When the framers of our Constitution met to hammer out civil liberties and freedoms, they sought for and received divine inspiration. Now, based on the truism that as a man thinketh, as a man thinketh, so is he. And based on Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 34, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. You want to know what's in someone's heart? Just listen to them. It will come out. Well, I want you to put that in context with what came out of these blessed mouths. Who were they? Some of the 56 signers of our Constitution. There were 56 signers. And I'm going to give you some quotes of what came out of their mouths. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So let's see what some of them said. These were the framers. And this isn't all of them. By any means. Richard Bassett, a signer, he said the following. Every person who shall be chosen a member of either house or appointed to any office or place of trust shall make and subscribe the following declaration to wit. they got to sign this. I, blank, do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Today, try that one on. And then the Holy Ghost, D-I-N, the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore, and I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration, one of the signers of the Constitution. Quote. Another one, named Gunning Bedford. Quote. Now to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be ascribed all honor and dominion forever. Close quote. William Blount, quote, No person who denies the being of God or a future state of rewards and punishments, translation, heaven and hell, shall hold any office in the civil department of this state. I'm just getting started. Jacob Broom, writing to his own son. Now this, he wrote to his own son. 
Don't forget to be a Christian. I have said much to you on this head, and I hope an indelible impression is made. I think he sort of banged it into him, evidently. John Dickinson. To my creator I resign myself, humbly confiding in his goodness and in his mercy to Jesus Christ for the events of eternity. Benjamin Franklin. I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs in the affairs of men, and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Close quote. Benjamin Franklin. We don't hear this, do we? Nathaniel Gorham. I believe the Christian religion and have a firm persuasion of its truth. Alexander Hamilton, for my own part, I sincerely esteem it a system which without the finger of God never could have suggested and agreed upon by such diversity of interest. What he's saying is, with so many agendas, the fact that we've formed a nation in this place is none other than a miracle. The finger of God, in his words. William Samuel Johnson, remember too that you are the redeemed of the Lord, that you are bought with a price, even the inestimable price of the precious blood of the Son of God. Now I'm just going through alphabetically these names. You believe this? William Livingston. I believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments without any foreign comments or human explanations. Just read the word, but read the word. That's what he's saying. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't enter a quote without saying I. That was my word. Let me start again. I messed his up. I got excited here. I believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, this is quote, without any foreign comments or human explanations. I believe that he who feareth God and worketh righteousness will be accepted of him. James Madison, quote, The belief in in a God, all-powerful, wise, and good, is essential to the moral or order of the world and to the happiness of man. Wow. James McHenry, quote, Consider also the rich do not possess aught more precious than their Bible. And the poor cannot be presented by the rich with anything of greater value. William Patterson. Religion and morality are necessary to good government, good order, and good laws. Roger Sherman. I believe that there is one only living and true God, existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are a revelation from God and a complete rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. And I, I skipped through several of those. Here I come to George, George um, Washington, W. Almighty and eternal God, Lord God, the Creator. I'm sorry, I messed up George Washington's prayer. It's so good, I gotta go back. George Washington. Almighty and eternal Lord God, the great Creator of heaven and earth, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, look down from heaven in pity and compassion upon me, thy servant who humbly prorate myself myself before thee. Are you getting the picture, dear ones? And that's not mentioning the preachers that were part of the signers, that we don't have anything quotes quoted from them, preachers, pastors. Dear ones, the reason America is great because America chose God. Amen. And the minute we leave him, we will receive just reward. And to remove monuments that were set in place in Washington that were dedicated to the glory of God would leave our capital with fatal scars, even in the architecture.
God is as much a part of American fiber as apple pie and baseball. God. God of the Bible. God is mentioned throughout all of our founding documents. And even though there are so many attempts at rewriting history, His story, His story, history, His story, is so indelibly impressed on every foundational pillar of this great nation that to attempt to take Him out would collapse the entire structure. That's why I say, again, God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with your light from above. Oh, they paid a high price for what they did. For instance, Richard Stockton, a Quaker from New Jersey, was one of the 56 signers of that declaration. He helped to construct the Quaker meeting house near his home in Morven. New Jersey. Stockton was a prominent lawyer and landowner until the day that he signed the declaration. The English army routed him and his family from their home and he was imprisoned as a traitor to the crown. As a result of his harsh treatment, his health was broken. After his imprisonment, he returned to the burned and sacked remnants of his home and died there four years later at the age of 51. You see, freedom is never cheap or free. Five of the signers were captured by the British and tortured until before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Nine either died from war wounds or from hardships suffered in the war. So no national icon better summarizes the freedom and the high price paid for our freedom than the Statue of Liberty. When citizens of other world countries become naturalized citizens, they receive with their citizenship rights and privileges guaranteed by the Constitution for every single citizen independent of gender, race, national origin, religion, age, marital status, or disability. Everyone has equal rights and privileges and responsibilities. Everyone. In the words of that Russian-born Branson philosopher, today he's in Branson, Yakov Smirnov. What a country! Of course, he says it differently. What a country! It's what a country. With all this said, though, in the course of human history, it is sobering to understand the implications of this timeless principle. The principle? Those who do not learn the lesson of history are doomed to repeat it. A brief look at history reveals that the average period of time before a given civilization collapses internally is a little over 200 years. History will show us Assyria, 247 years. Persia, 208 years. Greece, the Empire of Greece, when it was the big dog, 231 years. Rome, Roman Empire, 207. Spain, 250. Britain, Britain, 250. The average of those I mentioned, 232. So America's already six years past when we should have collapsed. Better wake up. Put God on the throne of your life. You need him. America needs him. God bless America. Bring us back to our roots. Many of us in the sanctuary this morning that have white or missing hair. Amen. <laughs> have been amazed at the speed of moral decay 
that has taken place in our country. We see it. We know where it was. Not that everyone that was in America were following Bible principles in their lives whatsoever. But there was a basic moral fiber in America. A basic honesty in treating one another. A basic care for the underprivileged. Instead, it's all about me. And we've seen the slide. Well, you see, the problem is citizenship does not deal with the bigger problem of mankind. Whether they're free or slaves or whatever their status is. Everyone has this common issue that's at the core here. Every single human being, with the exception of one, he was virgin born. Every single human being was born in bondage to sin. Lady Liberty can't do anything about that. <laughs> no, no. But as long as any person, male or female, young or old, willfully remains a citizen, they were born citizens of this world. Each one of us was born a citizen of this world. But if after we know and have light, we opt to remain a citizen of this world, marching to this drummer, adopting this value system that's in this world, we remain slaves, no matter how free we might think we are. <laughs> but I have great news. The freedom offered from slavery to sin is offered to every single person, independently of their gender, race, national origin, religion, age, marital status, or disability. Everyone can receive forgiveness and be released from the bondage of sin and sing with meaning, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Just as America boasts of a national icon located in New York Harbor, we who have received the forgiveness of sin and adoption as children into his kingdom, the kingdom of God, also have an icon. This icon has stood unchanged unaltered, untouched, unbothered, undamaged, unscathed, unharmed, and intact for more than 2,000 years. Those who find themselves at the base of this icon discover freedom and liberty in, their truest, in the truest sense of the word and are forever changed. You know what the icon is, don't you? The cross. The cross, the icon of the Christian faith, melts sin-hardened men. What do you do with a cross? What do you do with an innocent nailed on it? It melts sin-hardened men, transforms derelicts into productive citizens, turns hatred into love, bitterness into forgiveness, weakness into strength, discouragement into joy, blindness into sight, slavery into freedom, and bondage into abundant life. Emperors have tried to destroy it. <laughs> Philosophers have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those kneeling at it. Yet it still stands. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race, shall raise in one mighty course to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross of Calvary, is truly Lord of Lords, King of Kings, our Redeemer, and the Shepherd of our souls. We could go visit Ellis Island tomorrow by flying to New York and catching a ferry boat. 
The cross, it's a problem. You see, the cross of Jesus probably had been used many times before it was used for Jesus. <laughs> and probably many times afterwards until the nails had splintered up the wood so much it wouldn't hold the nails. So how do we have an icon? We have an icon that's visible through faith. Through faith. It's good we don't have the real... <laughs> You know, we'd be having pilgrimages there all the time to go see it and pray at it when he wants to be right here. He wants us to make a temple of worship right here Amen. in our hearts. Do you see the cross? Do you see it? Well, not the <laughs> I'm talking about the cross of Christ. That it's necessary for you to acknowledge as the only way you can have forgiveness. Abundant life. You see it. You see him, more importantly. His outstretched arms that are visible reminders of his glorious invitation. I started this meditation with that which is written on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming sh shore Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, we don't have a physical cross that has this inscribed, but if we did, it'd probably be inscribed with these words of Jesus, found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Are you weary this morning? Has your joy taken a hike? You seem like a distant memory. Is the burden that you are carrying this morning too heavy for you to bear? Is the journey that you are on this morning seem too difficult to finish? Is sin dominating your life and are you feeling its death grip on your very soul? Is what you are doing with your life working for you? Are you sick and tired of grabbing for all the gusto that this world system states that you need only to find it's all smoke and mirrors and deception upon deception? Are you tired? Tired of the inner battle of knowing what is right but always doing wrong? Are you fed up with being religious while all the while feeling that God is a distant, distant, unengaged, all-powerful whatever. Are you tired of trying to be good? Are you tired of putting on a happy face while your heart is breaking? Are you fed up with life in the land of the free and the home of the brave? then do I have good news for you or not? <laughs> there is room at the cross for you. Amen. It's not by might, nor by power, but by His Spirit. But for His Spirit to fulfill your life, to fill your life with meaning, He has to have your permission. And that's what happens when we come to the cross of Jesus. We say, Lord, I give you permission to come into my life. He'll honor our free will until hell. But he'll die to try to keep you from going there. Oh, he did. See, to enter his kingdom, a lot different than now the green card bit, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> we have the blood red car. <laughs> the green car, oh my, what hoops you have to go through, what courses you have to take. <sighs> when we got our green card in Brazil, it took us three and a half years, and we had to sign all kinds of disclaimers that we won't work there, earn any money in Brazil. I mean, it was crazy to get our green card in Brazil. It's what nations do. You've got to go through all these hoops and all these requirements. At the cross, one requirement is for you within your free will to say, Jesus, I come. Forgive me, a sinner. Come into my life. can't be bought, can't be earned. It has to be accepted by faith. And the invitation is open today for you. We're going to watch this last video clip. And um, if you would like to come forward, I invite you to do so.
I pledge allegiance to the land with all my strength, with all I am. I will seek to honor his commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Dear ones, as you leave, this music will be playing. Now may the wonderful love of God, the marvelous grace of Jesus, fellowship of the Holy Spirit accompany each one to their homes. For it's in the precious name of the Lamb, which takes away the sin of the world, we pray. Amen. God bless.